Welcome to video one for week three. In this week, we're going to talk about change of variables for multiple integrals. Let me start by reviewing substitution rule, which is change of variables for single variable integrals. For certain integrals, we approached them by using a substitution to try to make the integral more reasonable. So if I have a single variable integral like this, there may be a way of replacing the variable x with a new variable u, such that the integral becomes doable. The typical way we did this is we said that, well, u is going to be some function of the existing variable x, and then we had a relationship between the du and dx pieces, and we changed the bounds according to this function. In this setup, what I'm going to call the typical single variable setup, the original variable is the independent variable, and the new variable is the dependent variable of the transformation. The substitution is u equals g of x. This worked for certain kinds of setups, setups where we were looking to do reverse chain rule, where things were set up nicely that we had an inside and an outside function, or something about the substitution and the setup where we could find a piece like this g prime of x that sort of made it all fit together. There was one exception in single variable techniques, and those were trig substitutions. In trig substitutions, the order is reversed. The original variable is now the dependent variable, and the new variable is the independent variable. We still have the same relationship between the dx, in this case d theta, for a trig substitution. But the setup was quite different. Now we can actually replace all the pieces directly. We don't have to have a special form. And it turns it into something entirely new. The bounds also change. The bounds now need the inverse function. So to change the bound here, I need the inverse of the substitution, because these are the bounds in the original variable. These are going to be the bounds in the new variable. And the new variable being the independent variable, I need the inverse function to get back to that independent variable. I need the inverse function to change the bounds. Now it turns out that the second mode is actually the one I want to generalize to change of variables to multiple integration. And I think that sort of makes sense because it's the more flexible of the two. It doesn't require to have a certain kind of setup. It's really just changing the situation. That's what trig substitutions were doing. They were changing the situation to try and make a more reasonable setup, as opposed to more particularly trying to do the chain rule in reverse. The thing we're going to need is the relationship between the differential terms, between the du and the dx terms, or the d theta and the dx terms. This is more complicated because we now have multiple of these terms. We have dx, dy, dz in R3, for example. And to get that relationship, I'm going to go to a thing called the Jacobian matrix, which I introduced briefly in Calculus 3. I'm going to define it here only for functions that have the same number of input and output variables, because those are the kinds of things we use for change of variables. The Jacobian matrix is the matrix of all the partial derivatives. So each row, I take a component of this function. So f1 is the first output, f2 is the second output, so forth and so on. In each column, I take one of the original variables, x1, x2, up to xn. And between that, I get an n by n matrix that sort of captures all of the derivative information. So again, if I have this function that I'm representing as a change of variables, the original variable, as I said in the comparison with single variable situations, the original variable is going to be the dependent variable, the output. The new variables are going to be the independent variables, the input to this transformation. And I have the relationship between the differential terms is now the determinant of that matrix of partial derivatives. And I call that the Jacobian determinant or often we'll just call that the Jacobian. Now what you should think of here is matrices, determinants of matrices, measure the effect on area and volume. And this kind of thing I called dA or dV, depending on the dimension, it's kind of an infinitesimal area or volume. So this makes sense as a change in area or volume. It tells us how the infinitesimal area and volume in the new variables and the old variables relate to each other. I want to finish this video by calculating some Jacobian terms. In the next video, we'll get into some actual examples of change of variables for integration. So here's the situation. Again, the old variables are going to be the output, the dependent variables. The new variables are going to be the input. So I have x, y is some function of u, v. This is a linear change of variables. Uh, x is 3u, y is 4v. If I look at the partial derivatives, I get these. 
I put them in the Jacobian matrix, I get this. To take the determinant, I get 12. And that makes sense, because I'm dilating in one direction by 3, I'm dilating in another direction by 4. So the total effect on area should be an effect of 12. And that's how you should interpret this, is that the infinitesimal area dy dx in the old variables is equal to 12 times the infinitesimal area du dv in the new variable. Here's a nonlinear one where I have here x equals u squared and y equals v. There are the four partial derivatives. I put them in the Jacobian matrix. I take the determinant, and I get the determinant here actually depends on the new variables, and that is often the case. And this says that the infinitesimal area dx dy is actually depending on my location in the new variables 2u times du dv. So if I'm at a level where u equals 3, I'm going to have areas that are 6 times as large. If I'm at a level where u equals 4, I'm going to have areas that are seven, four, 8 times as large. If u is negative, I'm going to have some flip in orientation of the areas. So th this is another thing that can happen. A really important example, an example we'll take up in videos 3 and 4 for this week, is the polar coordinates. I'll go into more detail in videos 3 and 4, but let me briefly talk about the Jacobian determinant for polar coordinates. This is the transformation for polar coordinates, which you may remember from previous courses. There are the partial derivatives, there's the Jacobian. The determinant of the Jacobian is just the variable r. So this means that dx dy, the variable, the, the infinitesimal area in the original variables is r dr d theta. And I want to give you a visualization for why this should be scaled by the radius. So if I look at a piece of polar coordinates, these pieces have the same difference in radius, and they have the same difference in angle. So we have a first angle and a second angle, and then we follow those rays out, the first angle, second angle, those angles stay the same all the time. The difference between radius is about 0.4 in both of these cases, but this area is off, obviously a lot larger than this area. So the dr d theta, this infinitesimal piece of area, is small, when radius is small and large when radius is large, so it makes sense that it's scaled by the radius. The larger the radius is, the larger my little pieces of area in the approximation that build the integral are going to be. And one last example for this video, just another one that involves some scaling, um, xy equals u, uv. There are the partial derivatives, there's the Jacobian matrix, there's the Jacobian determinant, and again this is another one that involves the scaling by one of the new variables.